Greetings and welcome again to all shareholders and stakeholders to today's Dragonfly 2023 Q4 and full year earnings call. My name is Roly Bustos, and I remind all joining us today that I am the internal investor relations representative here at Dragonfly. We appreciate you joining us for this review and update. We will start with our CEO and President Cameron Shell discussing the fourth quarter and full year operational highlights. From there, our CFO Paul Sun will review the financials and we will conclude as usual by going through the pre-submitted questions that we've received. As always, you're welcome to reach out to me individually at investor.relations at dragonfly.com. Again, I remind everyone that this presentation may include forward-looking information and statements. These statements are not guaranteed their future performance or financial results and undue reliance should not be placed on them. Any future events or re results may differ from what might be discussed here. The full forward-looking disclaimer can be found on page two and in your screen right now. So Cam, please go ahead. Thanks, Roly. I appreciate uh, everybody taking the time today to uh, be on the earnings call. We really appreciate uh, your trust and consideration. So uh, 2023 was a pivotal year uh, for Dragonfly, uh, highlighted in particular by the fact that uh, we had now shipped our uh, production to uh, organic capability to produce well over $100 million internally uh, of product with uh, two production lines on our two main products, which we'll talk about uh, here shortly. We still maintain our full uh, custom and uh, contract engineering capabilities, as well as our workbenches, uh, which enable us to uh, produce smaller batches as well. So in 2023, uh, we had a little bit by design, uh, uh, especially in the last two quarters or three quarters, but two in particular with building out our new plants, uh, understanding that we weren't uh, going to grow the revenues uh, be because in fact, we couldn't grow the revenue because of capacity issues. So our revenue for the year was uh, $6.5 million with product sales being $5.2 million and provision of services uh, being $1.26 million. Uh, we did have a gross profit margin of uh, $2 million on that, so fairly healthy, and uh, which is about 31.5%. And as of the end of December, we had a cash balance of uh, just over $3 million. <clears throat> so some operational highlights from Q4 uh, in particular was uh, us receiving special flight operation certificates for transport from Transport Canada. Uh, we have received other certificates as well from uh, other jurisdictions. And uh, these ones in particular were for the wildfire uh, services that we were providing up to uh, the Canadian government. Uh, this is an area that's going to grow significantly for us uh, this coming year and was highlighted uh, by the capabilities of the particular drones that we have manufactured. Uh, we've also been working uh, very, very closely uh, with the United Nations on several initiatives that do relate to uh, wildfires uh, and in particular climate change and have had spoken a number of times and consulted uh, several times as well uh, with the World Meteorological Association in conjunction with the International Center of Digital Innovation, all part of the United Nations uh, Convention to Compact uh, Desertification. Um, Further to that, and uh, by far uh, the the enormously fast growing uh, area of the entire drone uh, market is the defense space. Um, and a couple of the highlights from Q4 uh, in particular were our uh, not just our display, but our demonstrations um, at Modern Warfare Week, not just of the Commander 3XL, but also of uh, several payload partners that participated uh, in Modern Warfare Week with us. Um, uh, leading up to that and out of that, uh, we have done uh, through uh, Q4 and into this year, we have done uh, multiple uh, live test scenarios and exclusive demonstrations with multiple branches of the DOD. Um, uh, and um, and those continue to uh, push forward in uh, support of the uh, of the orders that we have coming forward in that regard. So a couple of other things again to highlight was uh, was our no our new plant is now fully operational. Uh, it went uh, it opened in Q3 in Q4 it went operational. Uh, we have received uh, several um, best practices certificates and participated in a number of audits from different uh, defenses. 
uh, or militaries uh, in order to certify the plant ready for uh, production, uh, of which uh, we're just uh, now completing all of those certifications. So pretty exciting time for the entire uh, team uh, and the organization. Um, I think also of note in Q4, we did unveil uh, the Commander 3XL hybrid. Now, this is a hybrid that's really uh, uh, in demand in particular, that not just from our commercial customers, but from military customers. So this takes all of the capabilities of the Commander 3XL, which is really the Swiss Army knife of drones, and uh, puts a hybrid engine on it whereby we can run it by gas or electric. It takes the operational time frame from about 50 minutes uh, up to about two and a half hours. Uh, so you can imagine the e increased flight time, the increased range, and uh, the entire engine on that only weighs about nine pounds. So we are still have capability of well over uh, 10, between 10 and 15 pounds commercially, and even greater than that for military operations or defense operations uh, to be carrying payloads, um, whatever those payloads um, may be. Um, interestingly enough, uh, a lot of those payloads, as we're now looking at, are actually other drones uh, that uh, drop, in particular FPV drones, and uh, with swarming capabilities. Again, these this is uh, when we designed that Commander 3XL, we designed it with the ultimate inflexibility. Now, we didn't anticipate being able to, or we didn't anticipate necessarily uh, putting on a hybrid engine or being able to drop other drone systems or create swarming uh, with it, but that's just uh, uh, an indication of the versatility um, of this drone. We also hosted our first Dragonfly experience, uh, which was a first responder user conference at our uh, Joint Air Flight Facility in Texas. Uh, we had uh, at least a dozen different uh, services there uh, in attendance, uh, training, testing, uh, uh, flying machines, uh, trying payloads, uh, working through uh, use case scenarios, working through con ops, and a number of different things. And so that whole facility for us has just turned out to be um, an incredible opportunity for us to demonstrate not just our capabilities, but actually provide uh, uh, flight training and testing for con ops or use, potential use cases uh, that maybe aren't necessarily available for some of our customers to do at their own facilities or if they have facilities at all. And so this facility itself has everything from uh, sensor calibration to demining to uh, to tactical um, uh, grounds to all sorts of uh, different training uh, scenarios as well as conference centers and such. And so uh, we look forward to hosting more of our user conferences there uh, as well as keeping it extremely busy uh, as it has been with our, our customers. Um, the... Uh, the thing that's kind of interesting, especially in this uh, queue and, and coming out of Q4, is that we've got a record pipeline and a number of customer demonstrations that are happening. Uh, and in fact, we've really had to temper that be simply because of the amount of orders that we're now uh, preparing to fulfill and, um, and, and the resources that we have at hand in order to do both that work and uh, the work that we've got in terms of all the training and testing that's happening. So um, it, in, interesting and positive challenge to have, but not, nonetheless, uh, we, we, we can't, for technical reasons, call it backlog as of uh, the moment, uh, but, it, but we can call it um, you know, qualified pipeline uh, and customer demonstrations. So we're at record numbers there. Um, as everyone knows, I think the drone industry is uh, is growing, but the military impact has really been uh, absolutely incredible since the, uh, I think really all nations uh, or all defense uh, departments, uh, but in particular uh, NATO departments are really focusing on the small UAV uh, market. Uh, the Ukraine theater has demonstrated that small UAV is the tactical advantage now from anything from 5,000 feet down. So if you want air dominance, uh, you really need to deploy uh, these types of drones. So whether that's a heavy lift drone, whether it's reconnaissance drones, whether it's uh, FPV being first person flyer drones, uh, whether it be logistics drones, uh, whether it be munitions, whatever the case is, uh, it is now all about drones. And we think we're really well positioned with the product lineup that we have designed to be incredibly versatile. Um, you know, going into this, uh, you know, last couple of years, uh, you know, I think it's worth noting again 
that our experience and background, while we were the oldest commercial manufacturer in the world, uh, one of the reasons that we're the oldest uh, commercial manufacturers in the world is that we've done contract engineering for the military uh, primes, uh, you know, for basically about the last 18 or 19 years. And that's, in fact, what has been able to sustain the company uh, while all the other North American companies, uh, you know, didn't survive the last uh, 20 years. So this slide here just shows an example of the types of products that we have out there, uh, the type of products we've worked on, the types of products that we have worked on for uh, other organizations. And that top right corner represents basically military and the uh, and artificial intelligence, where the bottom left corner would be, you know, a very uh, consumer type of uh, toy. So we'll continue to focus in this area, and and um, as fortune would have it, it's um, <clears throat> unfortunately geopolitically, but as fortune would have it, it is the fastest growing area, and I think we're we're well positioned to um, uh, to become a major player uh, in that. Um, just a quick product review and update. We've got our heavy lift drones. Uh, as mentioned, we've launched the Commander 3XL. Uh, we have precision delivery systems. Uh, we have quick release delivery boxes. Uh, we do have many payloads that are integrated with dozens of different sensors from other manufacturers, whether those are cameras, whether they're ordnance, whether they're uh, uh, surveillance, uh, whatever the case may be. We've really, again, designed this system so that all of those uh, payloads can fit on this and then we're approaching the market as partners. The majority of our pipeline work uh, now uh, really is coming in from uh, payload partners. So these payload partners uh, work with a customer, whether it's commercial or primary military right now, um, where they've got a specific capability uh, on their sensor and then that sensor is in demand and then what we've done is integrated with that sensor to be the best of breed uh, uh, for that sensor to be able to work. And a big part of that is the amount of battery life that we can deliver and the amount of range that we can deliver uh, with our particular uh, platforms. Uh, it should be noted uh, that we will, unexpectedly, we will be having a number of products come out uh, through the rest of the year. These are purpose-driven products. These are products that have been specifically requested uh, uh, for us to build by customers uh, at scale. And so this has been the real um, kind of uh, eye-opening and pleasurable surprise uh, that we've had this year, where we've standardized on our Commander 3XL and our heavy lift drone as a platform. Uh, we will be having some new products come out this year that we will put into production lines uh, by Q1 of next year, um, <clears throat> which is a lot quicker than we thought, but it's just based on the on the specifications and the types of customers that are ordering uh, uh, and uh, giving us demand signals at size. So on this note, I am going to turn it over to uh, Paul to run through our financials, and then I'll come back and go through some Q&A. Paul? Yeah, thanks, Cam, and thanks, everybody, for joining, as usual. Um, at the beginning of the presentation, Cam went through the revenue for the year. Uh, just to reiterate, 6.6 uh, .6 million uh, versus 7.6 year over year, so down about 13%, and I think Cam explained um, the, the reason why that happened. Again, the split on revenue, uh, 5.3 million from product sales, 1.3 coming from drone services. Um, on the gross profit side, uh, 2.1 million for the year uh, compared to 791,000 from last year. Uh, this year's gross profit included a one-time non-cash uh, write down of inventory of about 331,000, while last year's uh, included a non-cash adjustment of 1.9. So to do it apples to apples, if we X out these adjustments, Gross profit decreased by about 370,000 year over year. Um, and as a percentage of sales, adjusted margin increased from 36.4% last year to 36.5. So pretty much the same year over year on a gross margin perspective. Uh, total comprehensive loss for the year, including all non-cash items was 23.7 million compared to a loss of 27.3 last year. Um, Again, there was the non-cash changes comprised of a, of a gain in fair value of derivative liability of 211,000, uh, an expense impairment on some notes receivable of 101,000, a write down of inventory of 331, an expense of goodwill and intangible impairment of, of about 87,000. So otherwise comprehensive loss, netting all that out actually wouldn't have changed too much, 23.4 million versus last year's 24 million, again, on an apples to apples adjusted basis. So slightly better year over year. Um, and then following that, the adjusted loss per share this year would still pretty much be the same at 56 cents compared to the adjusted loss from last year. 
of about 71 versus the, the 81 cents shown here. Um, on the next slide, please. Um, you just flip, yeah, we just kind of looked at the quarters now. So we just went year over year. So we'll now look at Q4 doing a year over year comparison. Um, revenue for the fourth quarter um, was down about 30% to 916,000 from 1.3 million in the fourth quarter of, uh, of 2022. Uh, fourth quarter revenue comprised of about 671,000 from product sales. Uh, with the balance of 244,000 coming from drone services. Um, the gross profit was 258,000 compared to negative 1.6 million in Q4 of last year due to one-time non-cash uh, write down of inventory and otherwise would have been 310,000 for the same quarter last year. So gross profit for Q4 of this year would have been 382 if we took away the one-time inventory write down of 123,000, while Q4 last year would have been 310 due to the one-time write-down that I mentioned earlier. Hence, gross profit for the quarter uh, was up 23.1% year over year, um, while an adjusted margin as a percentage of revenue was 41.7 versus last year's 23.6. So big jump um, on the quarters as on a gross margin basis. And that's as a result of kind of more sales coming from higher margin products um, in this quarter versus same quarter last year. Um, on the comprehensive loss for the quarter, 4.2 million compared to a loss of 16.7 million in the same quarter last year. Um, as mentioned, the quarter included non-change uh, and comprised of a fair value of derivative liability of 154,000 and a $123,000 inventory write down and would otherwise be a comprehensive loss of 4.2 million, comparing that to an adjusted loss of 7.5 million, Xing out that quarter's uh, one-time items. So uh, again, loss uh, quarter for the year for Q4, uh, quite a bit better, uh, decreases primarily due to lower professional fees, wage costs, and share-based compensation. We just went through the year-over-year -year, um, outlook for, or for, the, for the quarter. I'll now look at the quarter-over-quarter -quarter changes, meaning Q4 to Q3. So basically, sorry, Cam, just the previous, still the same slide, the, yeah. Uh, yes, that's right, yeah. So, so basically, um, revenue for Q4 uh, was down 57% compared to Q3, uh, just mainly due to some lower product sales. Uh, gross margin as a percentage uh, for Q4 was 28.3% compared to 41% in uh, the previous quarter. However, if we back up the one-time inventory write down, gross margin for Q4, as mentioned, was effectively 41.7%. So pretty much in line with the previous quarter. Um, total comprehensive loss for Q4, 4.2 million again. Uh, this time we compare it to a loss of 5.5 million in the previous quarter. Again, we X out the one-time gain and fair value of derivative liability and the write down of the inventory. Um, so that loss would have been 4.2 and we compare that to 5.4 million for the previous quarter. So again, quarter over quarter, the losses is, is better. And again, the decrease is primarily due to professional fees and wage costs. Um, now on the final, Slide, uh, if you just move it forward a bit, can't be yeah, that's great. Uh, you can see total assets decreased from 14.6 million uh, to 8.3 million year over year, uh, which is largely due to the deployment of cash and reduction of receivables and prepaids. The working capital deficit at the end of the year of 717 actually would have been a surplus of 3.5 million and shareholders equity would have been 4.6 million versus the 408,000 shown here if we X out the non-cash fair value of the derivative liability of 4.2 million. So just to remind everyone, the derivative liability comes from the fact that our functional currency is in, is in Canadian and we have some US dollar denominated uh, warrants, which the treatment is that it's a liability and which is why we're Xing it out um, just to kind of help you see the, the actual results. And, uh, and you can see we continue to have uh, minimal debt and uh, as Cam stated at the outset, cash balance at the end of the year was 3.1 million compared to 7.9 million uh, a year ago. And uh, with that, I'll pass it back to you, Cam.
Thanks, Paul. Appreciate it. Um, uh, what I'll do now is I'm going to uh, just go to uh, the questions that uh, came in and were forwarded uh, to me. And um, uh, but as of note, if there is any uh, questions, don't uh, don't feel uh, be afraid at all to reach out to me or to Roly. I do my best to get back to everybody. It's uh, it's overwhelming at times, so sometimes it's tough. And if I missed you, I apologize. Uh, but between Roly and I, I think we we come close to hitting about 100% of anybody that writes in, or we certainly try to anyway. So uh, first question is, uh, what percent of the company's revenue is commercial versus defense? Um, right now, it is. Uh, <clears throat> it was. It would be. It's, I'll give an approximation. Right now, it would probably be based on the numbers that we just went through here. It would probably be about eighty-five percent commercial and and fifteen percent uh, defense as a as just kind of like a, a very very broad uh, rule. Um, however, uh, you can expect, um, and I have to I qualify this by saying, in my opinion, uh, that in the coming. Uh, uh, this year, uh, you'll basically, you'll end up seeing this being 99%, uh, defense and, and maybe that's a, a bit of an overstatement, but let's call it 90% defense and the rest, um, uh, commercial, uh, and, uh, you know, by, by way of example, you know, one order that comes, uh, out of the customer base that we're working with right now in the defense market, it would be multiple times the size of, you know, our revenue for the past number of years. So it would just absolutely dwarf the commercial numbers. And that's where we've we've been putting our focus because that's where the big win is um, for the shareholders. That's where the big scale is. So it's been a bit of a bold decision uh, to do that because we've not been scaling the commercial business, even though there's really good demand there. And we've been focusing on getting the certifications and, and uh, meeting the demand requirements, you know, on the military uh, side. So while it's it seems skewed right now on the commercial side, the reality is it's incredibly uh, skewed on the military side. So hopefully that provides some clarity to that question. Um, the second question that I've got here is that uh, you mentioned that you have all this demand and an increased capacity, yet we haven't seen the new contracts and why. And so we've got the new plant built. We're going through the, uh, I'll call it the program of record certifications, all the rest of the clearances, everything that has to happen in order for the orders to start flowing. Um, and, uh, you know, there's very big moats around these orders. There's an incredible amount of testing. Uh, there's, um, uh, it's been, you know, a year and a half, almost two years of really intense work with multiple areas of, uh, of DOD uh, in order to, to put these uh, products through. And um, it's, and that's why it's it's just taken that much time. Uh, we're not seeing anybody else scale at this point either. But we ever I think it's pretty well known that it, that there are a few of other uh, players out there uh, who have well known names. Uh, a couple of which, one in particular, are public. They're on the verge of scaling as well, and um, and we're just starting to see the beginnings um, of that. So I think we're on track with just in fact where the purchasing uh, cycle is um, for this right now. <clears throat> so, um, what, and, and again, we couldn't be, uh, I mean, I still, you know, kind of scratch my head every day at not just the size, but at the capability and the requirements and the trust and, uh, the amount of exposure, uh, the depth at which we're able to, um, we're being trusted. Uh, and, uh, I don't know, I'm every morning I wake up incredibly proud of the team and the work that they do and the demonstrations and the tests that I'm not at the feedback that I get. And, it, you know, it's, uh, uh, a great story today. I can't be too specific, but, you know, I had a, a, a payload, uh, partner call up and, and mention a new opportunity with a new branch, uh, for their particular payload. And, uh, and they said that, that what was interesting is the first time this happened is that they wanted that payload, but they wanted to make sure that it was integrated with the commander because they, they want to make sure it's the commander that it's flying on. And that to me was just, uh, that was an incredible moment. And, um, uh, and I, and, and I think it's indicative of what's uh, going to continue to unfold. So, um, uh, there's a third question here is, uh, once again, uh, we did a low ball equity raise. Is this finally the last time? Uh, gosh, I hope so. I hope so. Um, there are, we, we, we have multiple, uh, financing opportunities or options, excuse me, in front of us. Um, I, I wish the markets weren't the way they were. I wish that we were getting the valuations that we were getting when we were 
half the company we were a number of years ago compared to our capabilities and demand uh, signals right now. And and having, you know, a $300 million valuation as opposed to a, you know, a 15 or 20 million or or less valuation right now. Um, so uh, it's it's been really painful for all of us. And um, <clears throat> I, I feel for the shareholders. I feel for our management. I feel for our board. Um, uh, I'm feeling that pain and going through it as much as anybody else. Um, and, uh, uh, the, the financing opportunities that we do have in front of us, of course, include equity, uh, but they also include more traditional financing as these tier one customers, uh, come on board. So, uh, we elected to do a small raise, uh, it, any future raises will continue to do small raises as well, uh, until the valuation or if needed, uh, at that point, the valuation is such that we would do a large raise. Uh, but right now, we're really focused on trying to keep the dilution minimal, trying to run things, um, you, you know, as close to uh, reasonably to the edge as possible so that we, uh, you know, are trying to keep all our costs in line, you know, relative to the size of the market that we're trying to address uh, and not trying to take in uh, too much money. So, um, you know, by by, by some small business standards, you may look at some of the numbers and go, wow, you're burning a lot of cash. But if, if you look at our, our, our competitors out there, in particular, the private competitors who have multi-billion dollar valuations aren't doing more revenue. In fact, they don't disclose their revenue, but I'm confident they're not doing more revenue than we are uh, or much more revenue than we are. And they've raised hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars and and lose multiple times per month. But they but they've got that big opportunity in front of, in front of them. And I do believe that they will be very successful. Um, so I think when you when you compare it on that basis of the size of the opportunity and where we're positioned in that opportunity, uh, you know, we're we're in it. We're totally within a reasonable range at this moment. So um, there's been nothing mentioned. Fourth question. There's been nothing mentioned about Ukraine lately. Is that not the focus anymore? No, but the U Ukraine's been incredibly important to us. It's it continues to be very important to us. Um, we're we're more quiet about it than we have been for many uh, important reasons. Um, and uh, but it's but it's a it's a focus, and we're big supporters of it. And it's been an incredibly uh, 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 poignant time for us to be able to look at our experience in Ukraine and relate it back to the experience that we're bringing to our products and to uh, the con ops of uh, the uh, the domestic militaries that we're working with right now. So uh, Ukraine will continue to be a focus for us. And, and at the appropriate time, you'll hear a lot more about uh, the work that we're doing there. It's just uh, it's just not appropriate uh, at this time for us to talk about. You'll notice overall that our PR has dropped off um, quite a bit. And that's that's. Um, that's just a requirement of, of where we're at right now with a number of uh, things and the customers that we're working with. So um, the fifth question is, um, uh, our stocks at an all time low. What's the plan to turn that around? Sales, sales, tier one customers. And um, and at the time that we can be a bit more vocal, um, we will be very vocal. And, and, and just because we're really proud of the work that our people are doing and the trust that the shareholders have given us. And, and I think... Um, you know, I've been fortunate enough to be in the game long enough to know when that swing is going to happen. And this feels like it's going to be a really, really significant swing when it happens. Uh, we, we'll be appropriately loud uh, when we can be at that point. Um, and and it will be very meaningful. Um, and, and we'll have some great numbers to back it up as well. So uh, sixth, uh, I think it's six here. One, two, three, four, five, six. Yeah. So has there been any interest from third parties to buy us? Yes. I'll just leave it there. Yeah. And, and that, that tends to be happening more and more. There's very interesting inquiries coming in uh, now. Be, and um, yeah, but uh, listen, we want to build a fantastic company. We think we've got multi-billion dollar potential here. Uh, there's certainly the market in front of us for us. We've got a product that's proving out uh, to be worthy of that. We've got a team that's able to integrate with the types of customers that we want to have. And uh, we have facilities and capabilities to scale to that now. So uh, those all become interesting things for people that are potentially looking to acquire us. Um, but at this point, we're looking to drive shareholder value through the market. So, um, and then the final question that I've got is, what is the greatest near-term threat to the company? Um, I think it's balancing you know, where we're at at this at this time in the market with uh, having made the strategic decision to focus on um, a very few uh, customers and get them over the line uh, with our particular products and the categories that they're in and balancing that with 
um, you know, managing the cash flows and managing the financings and such uh, between those two. So it uh, for us, it becomes a bit of a timing issue. We're within a, a quarter or two of that all happening and coming together. We feel confident with where we're at with the plan. It's been painful for everybody and in, in particular our, our shareholders. Um, but uh, um, that would be the greatest threat to us. Uh, we think we've got it in hand. We've been here before um in other projects and and uh but nothing with the upside of uh what's happening here so um uh i would have said you know previously uh our our biggest threat would have been finding the specific focus that has the scale that we would really want to drive down and we've found that now and now we just kind of got to thread that needle a little bit over this next couple of quarters so um that's the questions uh that we've had that have come in there might have been uh some others that i'm not entirely aware of but uh don't again be afraid to reach out to, to myself or to roly and we'll certainly do our best to get back to you uh as soon as possible again we deeply appreciate your trust and consideration uh the management team is incredibly committed and dedicated uh in fact not just the management team the executive the management team all the people here we really believe in our mission we think we've we think we've we've got now incredibly strong indication that we've got the right product lineup, the right service lineup, and um, it's uh, it's just a matter of time, hopefully, before you're able to uh, share the enthusiasm that we have internally here. So, on that note, uh, thank you from all of us, and we look forward to speaking with you shortly.